All right. Let's try this again. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 62. I haven't preached with one of these since like my youth pastor day, so this will be fun. Uh, Isaiah chapter 62, the big picture. Uh, God's story of redemption is what we've been looking at as we've been in this series since early September. Uh, and what we've said about the series, what we've said about God's story of redemption is it's summed up like this. It's God's people enjoying God's presence within God's place for God's purpose. So God's people enjoying God's place within, uh, or enjoying God's presence within God's place for God's purpose. Now, Advent and kind of the, the sub-series within the main series here, a little mini-series within the, the big series, the seasonal series, is uh, the incarnation of God's redemption. So if redemption, if, if God's big picture, if the big picture of the Bible, the grand narrative of what's taken place is God's story of redemption, then what we've learned is we needed a way for redemption to happen. We needed redemption to come to us because we were unable uh, to seek redemption on our own because of the effects of sin in Genesis chapter 3. So uh, Advent is the incarnation of God's redemption. It's God sending redemption through His Son, Jesus. And so we're just taking kind of an extended look at that over uh, what will be the course of five weeks. Uh, we're looking at the incarnation of God's Son, Jesus Christ, the man who put on flesh to be like mankind so that he could die in the place of his people, redeeming them from the curse of sin and death. Now, Isaiah pointed people to God's redemption through this man, Jesus Christ, through this incarnation, uh, some 700 years before the coming of Christ. And in Isaiah 62, Christ is now the gift called the anointed one. He's the anointed one of God sent to save his people and to establish them in Zion, which in the New Testament comes to refer to God's spiritual kingdom. So uh, just kind of summon this message up this way. The anointed one is God's gift for the redemption of his people. The anointed one is God's gift for the redemption of his people. And I couldn't think of a better thing to be preaching uh, just five days before Christmas morning. So let's pray and ask that the Lord would bless this time that we have. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we praise you. We thank you so much for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for, um, for, for your love for us, uh, for your steadfast love, your faithfulness toward us. Um, Father, we see this best in the face of Jesus Christ, your own son. Uh, we see, Lord, to what length you will go uh, to, to redeem your people. And so, Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. And as, as we look at Isaiah 62 today, Father, my prayer is this, my ask is this, help us to see Jesus more clearly, that we might know you, Father, more fully. Lord, would you help us to understand it by your Holy Spirit? Would you use your Spirit to illuminate the passage for us, uh, that we would see Christ this morning? It's in Jesus' name we pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. So I want to, before we jump into Isaiah 62, I want to kind of sum up where we've been. If you'll remember uh, kind of the darkness that was proclaimed about uh, the people of Judah in Isaiah 8, 22, it says, and they, and it's, it says this, and they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. God's people have been enveloped by darkness. It is overwhelming to them. Anguish is all around them. The darkness seems only to be getting thicker. It says that it will be, they will be thrust into a thick darkness. But what we find out in Isaiah and what, what Isaiah is pronouncing on behalf of God is that God will not abandon his people to this darkness. Though many of them have already abandoned him, God says, I have not forgotten you. So what will God do? Well, in Isaiah chapter 7, we're introduced to the, the first idea, the first sight of what it is that God is going to do. And Isaiah seven fourteen says, therefore, the Lord himself, God himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In Isaiah 9, we see this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, 
of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. There will be a child born of a virgin, God says. This is your first son. His name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. He will be a king, but a king like any other king, his reign shall never end. There will be no end to his reign. In fact, his government will only increase. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The Son is the one and only eternally begotten Son of God. In Isaiah 53, we see the servant, which I got to preach on last week. This servant is also the Son of God. The servant in Isaiah 53 will give his life up for God's people. He willingly suffers in their place. But it's not just that he's suffering like a tough life. He suffers death in their place. It pleases God, we read in Isaiah 53, 10, for God to do this to his son, to this servant, because the suffering will mark the end of the darkness that God's people have experienced, and it will bring about the redemption of God's people. Though the darkness of sin and the exile of God's people was overwhelming on the earth, God executes his intervention. God redeems his people. And he does it through sending his own son, the suffering servant king. And now what we see in Isaiah 62 is the consummation of salvation. It's the consummation of righteousness. It's all of these things won finally and forever. It's initiated and achieved here in Isaiah 62 by the anointed one, also the Son of God, for the sake of God's people. Let me read to you Isaiah 61, 62, 1 through 7. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest. And give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. You see, Zion here is a reference to God's holy place. But more specifically, as seen in the New Testament, it's a reference to God's holy people. Hebrews 12, 22 through 24 says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You see, it is for the sake of that city, the sake of Zion, this new Jerusalem. It's for the sake of the people who will dwell in that city that the anointed one refuses to remain silent. He must speak. He must not only speak, he must act on her behalf. He acts on behalf of his people so that they can truly experience salvation, so that they can truly know God. The word silent here at the beginning of Isaiah 62 there in verse 1 about the Lord will not remain silent balances itself with 
the idea of not remaining silent in verse 6 as God has placed watchmen on the gates. You see, the watchmen are intercessors. They're pleading with God to remember them, to never forget, to act on their behalf. And the anointed one, in verse 1, commits himself to ceaseless action and to ceaseless prayer. Hebrews 7.25 talks about this work that Christ now does in heaven for us. I think I mentioned this uh, last week. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You see, you're saved to the uttermost because Christ is in heaven alive, making intercession for you. Amen? If you remember in Isaiah 53, 11, it says there about the servant that he, provi he provided righteousness for the many. And that's exactly how we can know that righteousness belongs to God's people. We know it because of the sacrificial and intercessory work of this servant, of this anointed one. The anointed one is clothed in Isaiah, 50, uh, Isaiah 61 to accomplish salvation. And so salvation can only be ours because it is a gift of his. It's a gift from the gift. It's a gift from Jesus Christ. Amen? Therefore, we read here that salvation has dawned. We read here that salvation is like a burning torch. It's dramatic in its effects. And it's on behalf of the people of God. And it's because of the saving work of the Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Friends, you cannot have the cross of Good Friday without the gift of the birth of Jesus on Christmas Day. Do not divorce the two. The birth, the Christmas Day, was all with the cross in mind. He came to die. Zion was once mocked as forsaken and desolate. Yet God has changed her name to my delight is in her. You see, that's the gift of all gifts, is it not? To have a new name. It's not only a gift for the current people of God as we read about here. It's a gift for the whole world. That Zion will display her new righteous nature in all its glory. Zion will be aware of a new nature, complete with a new name. Zion will be a crown for the Lord. Alec Motyer comments this. He says, the surprising picture here is that the Lord holds his people as the sign to the watching world that he is king. You are the crown of Christ. God promises, then, a celebration, uniting the lamb and the bride whom he himself readies for the wedding feast. Listen to Revelation 19, 7 through 8 about what we have to look forward to. Let us rejoice and exult and give the glory, for the marriage of the lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her, given to her. It's a gift to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. You see, we're clothed in the righteousness of God. We are made ready for God by the Son of God. I can still remember the moment that Patricia walked through the double doors at the back of the chapel in which we got married. I remember seeing her come into, into view, and I remember my heart racing. I remember this giddy smile kind of washing across my face. I remember tears of unbelief, like, why that woman to this man? I don't understand. I remember tears of gratefulness to the Lord. And I just remember being full of joy in seeing her. That was my bride coming to meet me at the altar. And boy, was she a sight to behold. 
But you see, it can be hard for us sometimes to understand or maybe to believe that the imagery here is of God rejoicing over his people just like a newly married man's heart leaps as he looks at his bride. Whatever we might think about God, one thing we cannot miss, one thing that we don't think enough is of the image of God rejoicing over his people, delighted to see them, delighted to make them clean, delighted to be married to them. Here we see God filled with tender love and joyful commitment to his people. You see, the groom has come. The groom has washed his bride and redeemed her. Please hear me clearly. God is not motivated by some keep you at a distance contractual agreement. His heart is moved by a deep love for and delight in his people. Do you understand that? God fully sees your sins even more fully than you can see your sins. And he delights in you because of his son, Christ Jesus, because of what he's done. He desires to, and he's able to, bring salvation to his people. And through the bride, salvation goes out to the ends of the earth. Through the bride, we see that we become the proclamation of salvation to the end of the earth. Look at Isaiah 62, 8 through 12. The Lord, the Lord has sworn by his right hand, by his mighty arm, I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies, and foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it shall eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. These verses confirm all that has been promised and implied from Isaiah 61 through 62.7. What we see is that the Lord will act by his hand and by his might, with his hand and with his arm, with his hand and his power to secure the salvation of his people. But not only their salvation, he secures their enjoyment of, their relationship to him also. It's God's people now enjoying God's presence within God's place for God's purpose. It's redemption, full-on, complete redemption. The anointed one, as I said earlier, is God's gift for the redemption of his people. Because of what God accomplishes, the people are given a new name. Holy, redeemed, sought out, and not forsaken. God's people are called holy because he has made them holy in Jesus Christ. God's people are called redeemed because they have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. God's people are called sought out because God has sought them out and brought them to himself in Jesus Christ. God's people are called not forsaken because God is steadfast in love, always faithful, and he never forsakes his people. You see, God's people will never know what it means to be forsaken by God, because Jesus Christ was forsaken in their place. 
Christians are those whose name has been changed because of their union to God's anointed one, their Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen to 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. He says, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. So you weren't bought with silver or gold. Those things perish. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That's how you've been ransomed. The blood of Christ. And now you, as God's people, are without blemish and spot because Christ was, out with, was without blemish or spot. In 1 Peter 2, 9, we see these, this idea of these new na- this new name being mentioned again. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, but you are a chosen race, or you might say sought out. You've been chosen by God. You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people for his own possession, God's people, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So you're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and brought you into his own marvelous light. Amen? This is who we are. Such a name is not only a name and designation. It's not only a renaming of of who we are, but it's a renaming of what we are. It changes us. The old passes away, right? The new has come. We are new creations. We now bear the name of Christ, and we are invited now to live a cross-shaped life. We're invited into a life lived for Christ in which we're putting to death the old man and taking on the new man. A life lived for Christ in such a way that we are proclaiming the excellencies of the one who has brought us out of darkness into marvelous light. We then, as people with a new name, a new makeup, a new identity, should be willing to give ourselves for the glory of his righteousness and to suffer the joyful spread of the gospel in all the earth. It should be our willingness. 1 Peter 4, 16 says, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Christian, I encourage you, brother or sister, I encourage you, devote yourself to Jesus Christ fully, wholly, from now until the day that Christ returns. And listen to the consummation that awaits us when Christ returns. Revelation 21, 1 through 8. It's a consummation and then it comes with a warning. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, look at it, take hold of it with your eyes. Take a look. 
I am making all things new. Also, he said to John, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true, meaning you can take them to the bank. You can bet the plantation on it, amen? And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Now listen to this. To all who are thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. You see, there's a wonderful new reality that awaits Christians. That reality is the new heaven and the new earth. And if you're in Christ today, that's the reality in which you now live spiritually, knowing with a hope that is undefiled that Christ will return and establish himself and that we'll fall on our faces and worship him, that all things will be made new. And the reality is for unbelievers, for those who go on in unrepentance, for those who go on without faith in Christ, that you will be cast away from God. I said a moment ago, you cannot have the birth of Jesus without the cross of Jesus. And Christmas is not something that all people should just rally around to some giddy time of amusement where we exchange gifts and we're merry and we feast together. If you're doing all those things without the hope of Christ, you're doing it in vain. I'm encouraging you now to understand that the reason Christ was incarnate, the reason he came to be like us is so that he could die in our place, so that he could offer once and for all a drink from the river of life, that you would never be thirsty for righteousness again. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. You will be filled. So if at Christmas time you find yourself feeling empty and hopeless, I encourage you to drink from the water of life today, to see Christ for who he is, the anointed one, sent to save us from our sins and establish in the new Zion. You are, as Christians, the people of God. And as unbelievers, you have everything available to you that you need for salvation. Christ has died. Christ has risen again. Turn from your sin and place your faith in Jesus, and you too will live an eternal life. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I love you. I thank you, Lord, for Jesus. I thank you, Father, for your Son who saved us from our sins. I thank you, Lord, that you sent the anointed one for just this purpose, that he was not silent, that he did not sit idly by, but, God, that you sent him into the world be like us, that he could die in our place, that your people might be redeemed. And so, Father, on this Christmas 2020, when the world is in upheaval and, and things are as uncertain as they've ever been, one thing that we know is certain is that Christ Jesus lives in heaven forevermore. 
that he has saved us from our sins, that he's given us a new life, that he is the gift of all gifts. And we praise you for him this morning. Father, I pray for anyone here or listening online who doesn't know you. Father, would you bring them to the end of their selves? Would you help them to see their futility, their finite nature? Would you help them to be undone by their sins? Father, would you load on their back a burden for their sin? And then, Father, I pray that you make Christ so visible, so sweet, that they flee to him in salvation. Father, we thank you for Jesus. And we worship, we worship you today for the way that you've acted on our behalf. We praise you for salvation. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.